Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Kat. Maybe you've noticed a trend on the internet or among your families and friends. Uh, there's just this wave of quitting or leaving a traditional job um, and starting a new chapter that may sound very uncommon in the old days. Well, it's not just me. You have Dr. Guvi who quit his neurosurgeon job and many more posted their personal stories on social media. And today I've invited a dear friend, Taylor, who has a very unique and blended background. He is a multilingual professional, army veteran, biotech strategist, and historian. I can't wait to chat with him and share his story of how he left his job at a biotech CRO and became an author and published his first book. If you enjoy this interview, don't forget to thumb up and subscribe to my channel. Without further ado, let's bring in Taylor. Hey Taylor, welcome to my channel. Hey Catherine, thanks for having me. Um, maybe, you know, just introduce yourself first, including, you know, past background experience and your current focus. Sure. Um, so I'm Taylor H. Lunsford. I have to put the middle initial in there because there's another Taylor Lunsford who is a romance novelist and I don't want to be getting mixed up. Um, a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up mainly in Phoenix, uh, went to college at uh, Houston, University of Houston, uh, went into the army and I served as a uh, crypto linguist, which is a kind of uh, intelligence analyst who also learns a language. Um, so I went to the military's uh, Defense Language Institute over in coastal California, spent a year and a half there learning Chinese. Great experience, highly recommend it. Um, and then spent a few more years in active duty rattling around different, mostly West Coast duty stations. Um, I was out in Hawaii for a few years. Um, I was in Washington State for a while up at uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Um, and then after I got out of the Army, I ended up working in a clinical research organization back in Houston for a while, um, based out of the Texas Medical Center, a huge medical complex down there. I know you know it well. Um, and I used some of my uh, veterans benefits to get a master's in global affairs from Rice University, go Owls. Um, and now I'm back up in Washington State again. It seems like I keep bouncing back and forth between the West Coast and, and the Houston area. Um, but, but after doing a little over four years in the clinical research space, I took a break from that and I have self-published my first book. Uh, it's uh, sort of in an international relations and history kind of lane called The Myth of the Thucydides Trap, China, America, and Great Power Conflict. So that's I where I got I'm it at. right here. But it's blurring. Okay, there it is. <laughs> the, the cover's right, but... great, so the blur naturally wants to obscure it, but huh. that's, that's where we're at. Awesome. We have definitely a very unique, very interesting background. Um, and I want to maybe first dive into kind of your clinical experience as, you know, that was kind of the first experience you had after the Army. I'm just wondering, like, why did you choose that um, right after you, you know, leave the military? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the most honest and most immediate reason why I did it was because uh, as anyone who's gotten out of the military and made that transition knows, it's very difficult and it's very nerve wracking. Um, and this clinical research organization was the first place to give me an interview and the first place to give me an offer. Um, so I was pretty tempted to go with it just on those grounds. Um, but it ended up actually being a very good fit in a lot of ways. And I learned a lot from doing it. Um, some of the advantages, I would say, of working in clinical research versus anything else in the life sciences is that uh, you get to work on a pretty large variety of different kinds of products uh, in this space. I mostly worked with devices rather than drugs, but uh, there's a lot of different kind of consulting and research work that needs to be done on both sides. Um, even in a device focus, I got to work on surgical devices, things that were powered by AI or machine learning, different kinds of imaging, cardiovascular devices, some devices that were you know, life-saving interventions for pediatric patients. Um, so I got to work on a really big breadth of different devices and also ones that had a really big patient impact. So you feel like you're part of a positive mission, you're helping move science forward, you're helping improve patient, uh, patient outcomes. Um, so you can also kind of feel good about the work that you're doing. It has a, a kind of positive uh, social effect as well. Great. Uh, that sounds exciting, of course. But just kind of dive a little bit deeper. You know, what do you, what did you do, I guess, um, over there exactly? Like, you know, just kind of describe your average typical day. Um, you know, what would be kind of the bucket you would categorize? Is it more like R&D or is it more like business right. development or, you know? 
So it's a little bit on the borderline between what you might think of as R&D and what you might think of as compliance. Uh, so my main role was uh, regulatory consulting. And when you're talking about drugs and medical devices, the regulator is the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. So a lot of the work that I did was uh, in an early stage, I might be helping a company with a new product come up with their strategy of how they're going to approach FDA in order to prove that their product is safe and effective and to get it out of the market. Um, when they're further down the line in that process, I would be helping them interact with FDA and get feedback from the regulators on their plans for clinical testing or their uh, plans for manufacturing of the product or their regulatory pathway that they planned on taking. And then as they get closer to the finish line, there are different kinds of submissions that are like your final product that goes out to the market. If FDA approves it, then you have permission to sell in the United States. Uh, and if they kick it back, then your product still can't be sold. So we would go all the way up to helping them prepare those kinds of submissions to the regulators and make sure that they were actually able to legally sell their product at the end of the day. Um, yeah, different disciplines that kind of fall under the umbrella of clinical research are uh, there's a side that is more focused on developing and then carrying out a clinical study. Uh, so that's a study that uses human patients. The, the kind of uh, regulatory hurdles are a little simpler for animal testing or much simpler for bench testing. Um, but whenever you're doing testing in human, it's a very complicated process and you really need people who know that process to help you do it. So that's one leg of it. Um, there's the regulatory compliance, which was more my lane. You're talking to the FDA or uh, you may have different regulators in the European Union or in Latin America or in China or in whatever other market you're trying to get into. Uh, and then there's also quality management, which is a thing for a lot of different kinds of industries, but it's particularly stringent for a medical device because you want to ensure consistency. So there, there's pretty steep quality management requirements too. And that's almost an entire discipline of its own uh, within this space. So a versatile kind of well-rounded clinical research organization like the one I work for is going to have a clinical arm, a regulatory arm, and a quality management arm. Right. That's actually interesting. And I think my channel really touched upon on the regulatory and compliance sector of the healthcare. Um, I guess, you know, maybe just based on experience, share like one example or like, you know, either very difficult or very challenging um, device that maybe you have to convince FDA um, in a certain way to, you know, like get it approved. Let me think. Okay, so um, I mean, I'm still under NDA for everything, right? Oh so yeah, I mean, no, you like, have oh, to so like review so the product yeah. such and such, right? Yeah, um, but like something that away. I can say. Yeah. Um, one thing that was interesting is um, even though there's the letter of the law and the letter of the regulations, um, the science is always moving faster than the you know written on the book rules are. It's just like the nature of it. Regulators are always kind of playing catch up with where the technology is. Um, so a case where we really saw that was with um, this big rush of, of AI and machine learning based products that you've seen over the last few years. Um, in a lot of cases, these are things like um, you might have an X-ray or CT scans or something, and then you train an algorithm to scan it and see, oh, we think this one may have some form of cancer or, you know, here's a condition. It looks like this one may have it. It looks like this one doesn't. So they kind of help screen images. And then there's also more elaborate ones where you kind of uh, use it for monitoring purposes. You collect one kind of signal and then you feed it through a trained algorithm and then it can give you something like, uh, uh, I don't know, their, their blood oxygenation or their heart rate or whatever other kind of thing, an EKG read or something like that. And you get it indirectly from something else. So there's this big uh, kind of flourishing of different types of medical devices that use this approach where you're doing machine learning, you're iteratively training a piece of software uh, to interpret whatever the input is. And for a while, FDA, um, of course, they had like software engineers, you know, as part of their mm -hmm. teams, but they didn't really have AI people. So their teams would just be really stumped by how the AI software, the algorithms worked or the process you went through to train the algorithm. Um, you know, it's it's a multi-step, like you do different rounds of training and testing a machine train, a machine learning trained algorithm. And the uh, FDA people would sometimes think that meant that it wasn't a, like a fixed completed algorithm going out in the product that like the product was still like training itself in use, which, you know, that, which is a misconception that wasn't the case, but they, they just had trouble right. getting their head around it because it was so new. And then over the course of maybe two years, we saw um, FDA 
maybe they brought in more expertise, maybe they thought through it a little better, but they got much better about understanding how AI ML devices worked and their ways of uh, approaching these kinds of products got a lot clearer, much easier to understand if you're in industry uh, and more consistent too. So that's something where the technology got out there, FDA wasn't quite up to speed with it yet, but they had a process of getting more expertise and clarifying the rules and all that. And then, you know, a year and a half, two years down the line, they were much better at handling it. And it was, you know, much easier for uh, a company with that kind of product to get through. That's actually very interesting. And we've definitely seen this trend, I mean, all over the healthcare and other industries, right? Like using the machine learning and AI to improve whatever uh, diagnostics or medical device. But thanks for sharing. Um, I would like to maybe now like switch gear a little bit, kind of, you know, talk about your journey to become a published author. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I kind of want to understand, you know, why did you leave your previous job in the CRO and jumping to be a author? And, you know, if you don't mind, share a little bit about your book. Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks for asking. It, it was a tough decision to uh, leave, you know, a pretty solid job and something that, you know, I, I got pretty skilled at, was comfortable doing. Um, but I had always wanted to write and I always had ideas for books kind of rattling around. And I was always trying to find time to write, you know, even when I was in the military, it's long hours or when I'm working in grad school, you know, what I really wanted to do was write on these different subjects that really interested me. Um, and a lot of those subjects are, you know, they're historical, they have to do with social sciences, you know, whatever kind of sociology, economics, political science, international relations, all these things. Like I just am really passionate about these subjects. Um, and then I was working in more of a life sciences role, which has a lot of advantages, but it just didn't really align with kind of what I wanted to be doing in the long run. Um, you know, I did six years in the army and switched gears. I did almost five years in clinical research and it's starting to feel like time to switch gears again. Um, and I was in a position where I could really afford to take a short break and really focus on something that I wanted to do personally and just see if I could make it work, you know, financially for a bit. Um, so I left my uh, job in clinical research uh, a couple months ago and just dove right into writing. I had a book in my mind that, that I knew I could get out quickly and that I wanted to get on the page and have it be a finished product. So I just threw myself at writing this. And in the space of a few months, I got The Myth of the Thucydides Trap, the book that's uh, now out on Amazon. Awesome. Um, and what is this book about? I'm sure like, because mo most of the audience are yeah. more focused on the science or technology. So, you know, we right. would love a historian to teach us a little bit about that. <laughs> Sure. So the uh, this book is a response to a concept that a uh, Harvard professor of political science, a man by the name of Graham Allison, that he coined a few years back uh, to describe U.S.-China relations. So if you are maybe interested in international politics or if you read The Economist or Foreign Policy magazine or something, uh, Financial Times, you've definitely seen the term the Thucydides trap thrown around to describe the U.S.-China relationship and some of the kind of difficult strategic things about that. And the original argument that this guy, Graham Allison, Harvard professor, came up with is that there is a pattern throughout history where you have two great powers. One is sort of the, he calls it the ruling great power. They're at the top of the heap. And then another is the rising great power that's gaining on them and threatening to take the top position from them. Um, and he refers back to Thucydides, who, if you uh, remember high school history or anything like that, you maybe did Poli Sci 101. He was a ancient Greek writer who wrote a history of this uh, epic war between Athens and Sparta. So in that case, it's, you know, Sparta is the ruling great power in Greece. Athens is the rising power. And they have this big, bloody conflict over who gets to be in the top spot. So it's sort of taking that part and saying, well, it's now that's a bit like the U.S.-China relationship. I guess in this one, America is the Sparta, maybe a comparison right. we're not super comfortable with. And then China, rising China is the rising Athens that's kind of shaking up the order. Um, and then to support that argument, he has a case study or a case file of different events throughout history that he says fits the mold. Uh, he comes out of that saying, look, in uh, 12 out of 16 of these different historical events that we've looked at, it results in a war between the ruling and the rising power. 75% chances of war. 
So he goes out with this headline number and is saying basically there's a 75% chance that the US and China will fight a war at some point in the near future as they're stuck in this kind of great power transition between the ruling US and the rising China. Um, mm -hmm. And this won over a lot of people. It became very persuasive. Uh, he did a TED talk about it that was very well received. He's briefed Congress about it. He's met with Chinese diplomats to talk about it. Uh, people in US and Chinese governments have re referred to this idea. Um, and they're pretty much persuaded by it. That It seems kind of persuasive on its face. But the problem is that when you dig just a little bit deeper, there are really, really deep problems with how Graham Allison built this argument and how he supports his conclusion. So I felt it was necessary to do a really detailed breakdown of what is he arguing for and what are the contradictions in this, the shortcomings in it, what are the problems with the evidence that he rallies for it. So I kind of combined uh, my political science training um, because that's he's a political scientist mainly, that's his main thrust. I also took some of my training as a historian to point out how his read of the historical events, a lot of it's um, very, very mistaken. <laughs> um, and then also to draw on my experience, like learning Chinese, working, I actually worked with the Chinese military on a few occasions while I was in the army. I worked with the Taiwan military on several occasions. I've traveled back and forth between Asia. So having a little bit more uh, cultural and, and linguistic awareness of that part of the world than Allison has, also using that to inform things. Um, so my that's argument really is that, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I know I've been I've been going on. No, no, I was just going to say like that's actually really interesting, especially I mean I'm a Chinese and I've been hearing, you know, just throughout YouTube or different media sources talking about there there is potentially going to be a war between the two nations. And the the the, I mean, the reason that you just talked about it's it sounds fair to me, and I'm always like afraid that might happen, right? So I'm right. actually very intrigued to you know read the book and see your argument about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and as I was writing this, I mean, I kind of have the the different levels of training and social science and all this, but I wanted to write something that anybody could pick up and that they would benefit from it. They would learn from the arguments of it. They would get some more historical context. Um, they would start, it, it would give them some of the tools to, instead of it being like, oh, a Harvard professor said this. And right. so I don't have the tools to criti like to think critically on it. So I just accept it because I mean, he, he, he teaches at Harvard. He must know what he's talking about. To kind of yeah. arm people with the ability to critically think through things and, and not just go on the authority or I guess the credential of it. Um, so I, I hope you enjoy the book. I hope you get a lot from it. Um, I do not think there's a 75% chance of war. I think it's drastically lower than that. Um, and oh, you know, I, that. a lot of the arguments <laughs> in there. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm much more optimistic about it than, than, uh, Allison is for sure. That's awesome. Well, great to hear that. Um, I, I definitely will, you know, read this book on my hands right after our chats. Um, but another question I actually had, cause I ordered this from Amazon, right? Yeah. And, um, I, I think you did the self-publishing route and could you kind of just like tell us a little bit about how you kind of publish this through Amazon and how is that different from kind of the traditional way of um, publishing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a great question. Um, when I previously was looking at writing books and selling them and, you know, actually achieving that, uh, I really overlooked the self-publishing route. I wanted to go through a traditional publisher. I wanted to get shelved in Barnes and Noble. That was the approach that I wanted to take. And I really didn't consider self-publishing at all for years in this process. Um, and then what I found is that um, I was kind of out of step with how people actually buy books and how people choose what to read now. Um, I'm somebody who goes and browses at a bookstore and I thought that's what most other book readers do. And it turns out that's not really the case. Most books that are sold in America are sold online through Amazon or through BNN.com. Um, and out of those, a really large chunk, I, I think it was something like 30 or 40% of eBooks sold on Amazon are self-published yeah, books. Yeah, so, I mean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and it they're they can be really inexpensive. They're not necessarily like any different in quality from a self-published book. Uh, I mean from a traditionally published book. Um and it's just more in step with how people buy books and how they consume these things now. And so I started looking into the self-publishing route more mainly because of that just realizing that a, a pretty big chunk of the books sold are going through this route. It's not a marginal thing anymore. It's a really big part of 
books as a whole. And I started looking into things like the royalty structure and the process of getting books out there. And it, it pretty much is the case that unless you are um, a very particular kind of writer, self-publishing is probably a better deal. You know, if you are someone who already has a very large audience um, and you're very busy, so you don't want to have to do a lot of the extra steps yourself. You don't want to have to do any, uh, you know, you want to have an editor handle things like that for you. You want to have a professional cover artist do cover art for you. Um, then traditional publishing has an advantage there. They can get your book on a shelf. They can promote it a little bit for you. They can help it reach that big audience that you've already got. And then you don't get a great cut, you know, book per book, but you can move a lot of copies and then that turns into real money, right? But if you're not that kind of person who has like, I don't know, a quarter of a million followers on Instagram or something, then it's difficult to get your book picked up by a traditional publisher because they're they're like, if we can't move tens of thousands of copies, it isn't really worth our time. Um, so that's the first barrier. And then the second one is that your uh, cut of royalties from the book can be four times higher uh, if you're self-publishing and selling through something like Amazon than if you were to go through a traditional publisher. So you may be moving fewer books, but you're getting four times the cut per copy sold. So it's not, you know, it's not hard for that math to end up working better right. in the favor of the author. Um, another really important advantage of specifically going through the Amazon Kindle self-publishing um, rather than some of the other kind of indie presses that have been available previously uh, is that you don't have to pay up front to get a big inventory of books printed. Uh, traditionally, indie publishing is you're paying for, you know, 100 or 500 or 1,000 copies, and you get them in a big box, and they sit in your garage until you can sell them off and make your money back. Um, but with Amazon, they're able to make uh, paperback and hardcover books that are printed on demand. So you get one order, they print one copy, and they send that copy out. They take their cut that covers the cost of manufacturing, you know, and their little bit of profit on it, and then the rest goes to you, the author of it. So you don't have to like pre-order a big chunk of these books and put a bunch of your personal money into it and gamble not making that money back. So that's a really big advantage for someone like myself who wants to put something out there. So it can be discovered, so it can be read, maybe it can get some traction, but I don't want to be putting hundreds or thousands of dollars into getting this book out there because, uh, you know, it may not make it back on your very first thing that you publish. Yeah, that's actually good to know. I mean, that could actually promote a lot of, you know, um, I guess uh, they always want to be writers, but they know they don't have the money to really order all these inventories, as you said, and they yeah. can use this self-publishing route through Amazon to achieve their, you know, author dream. That's actually really nice. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it makes the bar for entry just to get your book out there much, much, much lower. And some of the people who I've met who do the self-publishing, you know, they, they write something like a memoir that they just want available to their extended family, right? And right. it economically makes sense to do that, you know, if you're, if you're going through Kindle. Um, and even some of the books, they sell really well. You know, uh, the movie, um, The Martian, that had Matt Damon in it. I, I didn't know this oh. until recently, but oh, that was based so on a self-published novel. Um, wow. So occasionally things do break through and they really move big units that are, you know, competitive with a high performing traditionally published book. But even if you don't put up those kinds of numbers, you're getting a 70 percent royalty cut instead of a 15 percent royalty cut. So there's a lot of room to make it work. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, I'll definitely also, you know, kind of link your book on the, the description box below um, in, on this video. So if people are interested, they can kind of take a sneak peek and order from the Amazon. Oh, well, thanks uh, for sharing all these tips and tricks of your career. But one last question before we wrap yeah. this up yeah. is, you know, if you have any last tip for people who kind of want to pursue a non-traditional career path. OK, so um, I would say that uh, it is true that credentialism is a big thing. Um, so it can be difficult to break into a career if you don't have a degree or some kind of certificate that's directly applicable to it. Difficult, but not impossible. Um, I did not have any kind of training in life sciences. I did not have a degree in the life science space, but I was able to get into a CRO job, clinical research role, based on soft skills. You know, I could demonstrate that I was, you know, a smart person who can pick up new hard skills quickly, who can be adaptable, who can learn on the, their feet. 
And in some cases, that's really what people are looking for. Um, some of these skills are really important, but they're niche enough that people aren't just coming off the assembly line with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in it. Um, so they need people who are willing and able to learn on their feet and to sort of do an apprenticeship model, learn by doing. So there are roles that are out there for you. Um, I think that sometimes going for these roles where the employer is looking for a really specific credential, uh, it can just lead to frustration, just trying to go for it when, you know, it's, uh, they're getting a lot of applicants and they're screening out for people who have like a particular profile of education or past work. Um, so I would say for people with uh, unorthodox career paths, um, it's definitely doable, but it requires a different mentality because you're trying to market yourself as a person who is versatile and flexible and who is able to learn the hard skills of the job on the fly, rather than showing up as someone who is like, I have these sets of hard skills. You know, I may or may not be able to work with a different set of hard skills, but I have this particular skill set you're looking at right now. Um, so it can be challenging, but it can definitely be done. I will also say that uh, military benefits have been a really big part of my kind of personal and financial success. Um, but the trade-off has been that the six years I was active duty, um, I did things that I'm personally proud of and that were career highlights for me, but civilian employers don't really know what to make of it. So that has also been a trade-off. I've gained a lot. I've gained education benefits, disability compensation. Uh, I learned a language, all these things that are really valuable and really helpful. But it is, it, it is sadly true that a lot of employers don't really know what to make of what I was doing during that time. And it's sort of a challenge to communicate to employers sometimes. Yeah, we definitely hope more veterans value being seen by the traditional employers. And hopefully, you know, more of you guys can go to different routes other than the tra traditional ones that, you know, at least I've heard, you know, police officers or, um, I don't know, something on, on that line. <laughs> but yeah. we'd love to you know, have you guys uh, on the life science side and healthcare side as well. Um, but great to, you know, thank you so much for sharing all the tips and um, well, congratulations again on the first book thank and you. hope to see your second one very soon. Yeah, um, I'm already working on my second book. So with any luck, I'll have it published uh, sometime late this fall. I'm targeting October, November timeframe. Awesome, wow, that's very speedy timeline. Great, well, thank you again for coming to the channel and have yeah, a great thanks day. Thanks for having me. Bye, All right, take care.